Good morning. We're so glad you're with us today. You know, ministry hasn't stopped, and we've been encouraged to hear stories from many of you of how God is using our continued efforts to bless and meet the needs of our community. One area is through our monthly food distribution that hasn't stopped. If you have to go out, we have a drop-off system set up for our monthly grocery distribution on Mondays and Thursdays from 4 to 5 p.m. If you'll drive up, we'll unload your donations and you can head on your way. You want to make sure to check out the church's calendar as well. Some summer activities like camps and adventure days are changing. They're changing dates or they've been postponed, so you definitely want to make sure you stay up to date by checking out our calendar. We're so glad that you're joining us. We want to encourage you to continue to share these videos and the video devotions on our website's blog with your family, friends, and neighbors. We do miss meeting together, but are encouraged to see again that our video sermons and devotions are reaching thousands of views each and every single week. And we want to thank you for being a part of that. We've been able to share with people we normally wouldn't, and each of you have been a part of making that happen. We want to remind you that if you know somebody who doesn't have Facebook or easy access to the internet, that audio CDs are available and they can be mailed or delivered. Just simply call the church office at 632-3335 and we can help you out with that. Thank for you for your faithfulness and giving your tithes and your offerings. And even though we aren't meeting together physically, again, our ministry and future ministry plans haven't stopped. Now, before we worship together through song, take some time to give your tithes and offerings through our app or online. We'll see you in just a few minutes. Good morning, First Baptist family. We're glad that you're here with us. Just rejoicing and praising God. Will you please join us? One, two, and ready. There is no song we could sing to honor the weight of your glory. There are no words we could speak to capture the death. Jesus, there's no one like you. Jesus, we love you, ever adore you. There's no one like you. Jesus, we love you, ever adore you.
Jesus, we love you. Ever adore you. There's no one like you. Jesus, we love you. Ever adore you. There's no one like you. Jesus, we love you. Ever adore you. There's no one like you. Jesus, we love you. worthy of our praise, Lord. We celebrate you. wonderful name of our Savior, Jesus, the one who died, was buried, and at the third day, rose again, triumphant. you 
Yes, what a mighty God we serve. He is worthy of all praise, glory, and adoration. Even through difficult times, such as pandemics, crisis, we praise you, Lord. We give you the worthiness that you deserve.
I'm so glad that you're able to join me again this week as we study God's Word. You know, spring makes me think of seeing massive fields of crops being planted. You know, a farmer plants his seeds, but then doesn't treat the ground as it doesn't matter whatever he does with it. He doesn't go out and, and then build a road across his field or a dirt track or a barn on top of the field he just planted. He treats the ground with care, looking forward with confidence that there will eventually be crops and a harvest. The resurrection of Jesus and now our future resurrection to cause us to look at our lives and our bodies in the same way. Turn with me in your Bibles to 2 Corinthians chapter 5 as we look in the next few weeks at the responsibilities and the power of the resurrection of Jesus and what it brings to our lives. The passage tells us that Jesus' resurrection leaves us groaning for the future. Let's read. Now we know that if the earthly tent we live in is destroyed, we have a building from God, an eternal house in heaven, not built by human hands. Meanwhile, we groan, longing to be clothed with our heavenly dwelling, because when we are clothed, we will not be found naked. For while we are in this tent, we groan in our burden, because we do not wish to be unclothed, but to be clothed with our heavenly dwelling, so that what is mortal may be swallowed up by life. Now it is God who has made us for this very purpose, and has given us the Spirit as a deposit, guaranteeing what is to come. Now Paul knows that whatever this life may bring in terms of suffering and death, the life to come will be filled with the glory of God. He begins by referring to our, our physical existence right now, our bodies, as a tent. Of course, this stresses that our time in this world is temporary and unstable like a tent. The human death rate still remains at 100%. Death remains a feared enemy of most people. No matter how much we try to extend it or, or say it's just a natural part of life, the fear of death could have easily become a threat to Paul's and our own boldness. He explains why he's not tempted to play it safe or retreat in the face of potential death. Death was something related to sin, which destroys life. And death affects everyone since everyone has sinned. Our sin empowers death to reign as an enemy. Paul didn't fear physical death because he knew that his power had been ended by Christ's death and resurrection. Now, because of the resurrection of Jesus, we who have put our faith in him also will be resurrected, and we will have a building from God, an eternal house in heaven, a, a new body. Paul's confidence in God's future care causes him, like it should all believers, to groan, to long in our present suffering as he longs to inherit what God has in store for him in Christ. So there is a, a groaning of anticipation because of what God has promised believers while enduring suffering and even the threat of death. We can say like David did, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Paul longs to be clothed with his heavenly dwelling because he's confident that he will not be found naked like Adam was after the fall. He will not be condemned by God in the final judgment. Neither will he be some disembodied spirit floating around somewhere. At death, we receive a, an interim body and must still wait for the coming of Christ and the resurrection before we receive our final resurrected body. So how do Christians know that the promise of a heavenly existence is real? Well, Paul's answer is, is that the experience of the transforming power of the Holy Spirit now in our lives is evidence. And it's a guarantee that God's promises are real and will take place. So our resurrection 
will perfect and finish our salvation. These struggles in the body we have now will be eliminated. This body that's weighed down by, man, all these things in life and is actually wasting away is going to be transformed. The life given to us in Christ just absolutely engulfs and overwhelms our mortality. So the temporary reality of our lives that, that so many spend billions trying to preserve and extend will eventually come to an end, be destroyed. The only thing that matters then is have we accepted God's offer of salvation in Jesus, which brings our resurrection. Our lives should be and can be filled with confidence because of the assurance of the resurrection. We can find great joy and comfort in this life despite all its sufferings and even the ultimate threat of death because of the Holy Spirit in our lives. So though Easter has passed, we are still to proclaim what it means for believers. Death has been defeated. It is no longer the end, but a transition to life without the problems of sin and leads to a personal resurrection and an amazing life to come. Now, not only does Jesus' resurrection cause us to long for a future, it also gives us confidence now. Look at uh, chapter 5, starting at verse 6 with me. Therefore, we are always confident and know that as long as we are at home in the body, we are away from the Lord. We live by faith, not by sight. We are confident, I say, and would prefer to be away from the body and at home with the Lord. So we make it our goal to please Him, whether we are at home in the body or away from it. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive what is due Him for the things done while in the body, whether good or bad. So we see here, that, that Paul's life is filled with confidence wherever he finds himself because of the hope of the resurrection. He knows that his future with God is secure no matter what takes place in the present, including his own death. Therefore, Paul, like all believers, lives by faith, not simply by sight. He gives himself completely to his mission of sharing the good news of Jesus because he knows that God will not abandon him even in death. There is promised a glorious future for him, guaranteed by God's Spirit. Now, because of this future of being with Christ in heaven, Paul is saying that there's part of him and all believers that would rather be with the Lord right now. Paul longs for full fellowship with Jesus. Instead of this causing him to give up on this world, Paul's ambition, his passion, is to please Christ now and absolutely forever. Paul now switches themes a little, and he moves from assurance to a warning as he discusses the implications of, of this confidence we have. He says that we all must appear for the judgment seat of Christ. No one, including Christians, can escape it. We will be held accountable for our individual actions and commitments and things that we've done. The chances that anyone might kind of slip through or, or fool God who knows everything, including our thoughts, is absolutely zero. Jesus and the Bible are very clear that followers of Christ will have to give an account of their lives. While we are righteous in Christ by faith alone and will not suffer the wrath of God and eternal punishment, our faith is expressed by our obedience and by pleasing our Lord Jesus Christ. So we strive to please the Lord now. But there are eternal consequences and rewards for what we do and don't do now in this body. God cares about how we spend our lives, use our bodies now as His children. Our ambition should be to have Christ's approval, whether in this body or out of this body. We are to please the Lord by obeying God's Word, by serving others, enduring suffering as if there is greater to come. 
living by faith, confident in the resurrection of Jesus and our own, avoiding living as if this life is really all there is, and then bringing glory to God by living out and sharing the message of Christ, reconciling death and having those gospel conversations. Basically, living boldly with confidence of God's promise of resurrection for you and I personally. Now, the resurrection of Jesus has so many amazing promises for us. Your experience of God today should create a a craving, as Paul said, a groaning for the full revelation of His glory in the future, which then creates in us a deep desire to please Him in view of what is to come. Now, the resurrection of Jesus and your coming resurrection gives you the confidence to risk it all for the gospel, to live boldly. Therefore, the goal of life is not more pleasure on earth, but striving to please God in heaven. We do not live under the coming judgment, and, but yet we do live under a total evaluation of Christ of our lives. The life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ are the only basis on which God can forgive and reconcile us to Himself. Jesus is the only way of salvation for the entire human race. We cannot save ourselves in any way, any way at all. Whatever you trust in for your future determines how you act in the present. If your trust is in your retirement account, you're probably pretty nervous right now. What you do is the means of evaluation as you stand before Jesus Christ. Since it reveals the genuine nature of your faith and trust in God. Now it's easy to lose sight of the fulfillment that we can gain from pleasing the Lord. Especially since what we enjoy is extremely limited right now in what we can do. It's kind of like filling up on junk food before Thanksgiving dinner. We can get so full on these second-rate happiness things of this world that we're too full to really hunger after God. We even talk about heaven as if if it's an extension of our, our greatest pleasures on earth. We'll be hanging out with family and friends, Uh, drinking tea, fishing, golfing, eating all the delicious food we want without gaining weight or having any blood pressure issues. But to make our focus of heaven about anything or anyone besides God himself is ludicrous and even makes heaven less appealing in the long run. When we don't focus on what is guaranteed to come through Jesus, all we can imagine is this earth. We then groan for a better time on earth and yet are constantly disappointed and frustrated. But when we groan for the life to come and focus on pleasing Jesus who brought us this life, our life takes on earth takes on a greater joy and purpose. It truly becomes abundant just like Jesus promised, no matter the circumstances, suffering, or even threat of death. We then live with confidence and boldness, striving to please our Savior, regardless of what's happening now or even is threatening to happen in the future. Let's continue to live in the power of the resurrection of Jesus Christ and not build over what God has planned for us. Let's pray. Dear gracious And loving Heavenly Father, again, we're still in awe of the power of the life, death, resurrection, and now glory of Jesus Christ and what it means for us. So, Father, it's so easy to get wrapped up in this body and this world, and yet there's greater things to come. Remind us of that, Lord. What we do matters. What we say matters. And you want to use it for your glory. So, Father, help every one of us this week to have a passion and a desire, a longing for a future, your future, and a really great desire to please our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. It's in his name we pray. Amen.
There are so many ways we can respond to hearing God's word each week. Here are just a few ways you might respond this week. I will begin a relationship with God through Jesus Christ today because of his victory over death through his resurrection. I will look forward to the hope secured by Jesus' resurrection in our future eternity with him and not long for what this temporary life on earth has to offer. I will live in confidence of the hope from the resurrection, taking captive every thought and deed and making it obedient to Christ as I share the gospel with those around me. Living in confidence of the hope from the resurrection, I will get back to the basics of my relationship with God through obedience and worship, being a disciplined student of the Bible and prayer, serving others and sharing the gospel. Whatever your response is today, don't hesitate. Do it quickly.